So Dylan is going to talk to us about David and Goliath and getting Ruby into the Enterprise. I don't think it's the Enterprise from the, um, the Star Trek stuff. I think it's the other Enterprise. And uh, he just flew in from a mountain in Colorado somewhere. Uh, so give Dylan a big round of applause. It has to do with Ruby because that's the 
language that I um, really, really enjoy programming. And um, I think, you know, there's a lot of reasons that um, it, it, it could be Ruby. I mean, um, Python's great as well, but I prefer, prefer Ruby, and um, there's some things that you can do um, with Ruby that you can't do with a lot of languages. Um, so, enterprises still need to iterate quickly, and Ruby and Rails, you know, especially, came out and, and made that possible, like blowing the kittens out of nowhere. You can, you can do that. And um, in large brownfield applications that exist out there, um, that's, that there's some other responsibilities that uh, need to happen. Um, benchmarking, profiling, regression testing, um, you know, analytics when you do releases across um, different, uh, different continents. Um, and so those get added to the mix. So you're not just developing software and releasing it. You have to do all this other stuff in order to in order to uh, get, get the uh, your deployments out there. And a lot of these companies are not doing continuous deployments or continuous integration. Either. So you know, anytime they do a release, it's like next year we're going to do a release, and it's going to be amazing. And it's probably going to be a month of not sleeping. Um, but these companies, they still need to innovate. So a lot of, um, a lot of large enterprise companies, um, we hope that they have small internal teams that are, uh, that are playing with new technology. Because if you don't innovate, you die. Um, and there's lots of companies that we run into that don't really even think that way. And they think, hey, we've got where we're going. Our stuff's written in Fortran. It's awesome. And it's going to live forever. Um, but there's you know, the, obviously the job market and other factors are in play there, so that doesn't always happen. Um, and they need to integrate, so that map with all the different technologies all over the place, um, they still need to talk to each other. And so you know, Ruby is one of these languages that has you know, amazing uh, bindings with other languages. Um, so landscape, um, you know, Ruby 93, that, this is stuff you guys all know already, but, um, you know, Ruby as a language, I, mean, I came to it from Java, um, I was really excited about it, and I'm sure that a lot of you have come from different languages as well, and are here because you really like languages, um, like Ruby, and, you know, I think that having a talk on enumerable, like, how awesome is that? I mean, you, I've never been to a Java conference where they have, like, an iterator talk, did you imagine how full of would be? Super. So, I mean, this is something that's pretty unique within the Ruby community. I mean, you have just simple features of the language that are just so beautiful that we all want to like present and um, and talk about and have you know, user groups about and, and um, you know keep you know, look diving into the code and making things better. Um, so, you know, this is kind of just a metrics of where Ruby's at in terms of the, the, the rankings, official rankings. I mean, you know, from 2006 to 2011, you know, Ruby's done, you know, made quite a, quite a change there. I mean, the only one that compares is Objective-C next to Apple. Um, and, and that's kind of, you know, the, the more metrics we have like this, um, the more you're able to kind of make a case for yourself um, at large, at these large companies. Um, and I don't know if you've ever worked in some of the other stuff like you know, JSP, ASP, or their, their uh, other frameworks like Struts or Spring. Or, I mean, it's not the most fun thing to do. I mean, it's it's painful. And you know, I think that's when Rails came out, and everybody's like, "Oh, wow, this is really nice." I just did a foobot command, and, and it's like a web application. Right? Um, so, I mean, I think a lot of people jumped onto Rails too because it gave us lots of nice constraints. It gave us an uh, active record, a super strict MVC uh, framework, and so it was kind of hard to mess up when you were building Rails applications. Um, and so there's, you know, there's big companies using uh, Ruby for lots of different reasons. Um, and what you'll find is you'll find that there's these little um, kind of innovators within these large companies that need to do, whether it be an internal tool or a, a larger project, that they will find out about Ruby, they'll find out about Rails, they'll hear it being spoken around the, the tech scene, and they'll hire a group of people to come in and, and do Ruby and do Rails work. 
Um, and when you are in that situation and you're able to get in to the system, I mean that's that's a that's the first step, and that's a, kind of a kind of an important step because you're not going to come from the top and be like, hey Ruby, Rails, change your whole infrastructure. Um, you need to find a small way in and then uh, grow from there, and you need to approach that delicately. So also there's a good you know case of you know J Ruby, Iron Ruby, Raya. I mean these are all you know, awesome virtual machines that people are writing a Ruby-like syntax on top of. Um, I think that is kind of a testament to how how nice Ruby is. I mean, Ruby likes programming it. That the language itself is is is, is nice. Um, and there's in the landscape, there's lots of um, stuff happening in Ruby. Um, you know, Amazon just announced the official SDK for AWS services. Um, so, uh, but perception. So the perception of of Ruby, I think, is kind of a hard nut to crack because you still get, I think when, when Rails came out, uh, you still get the kind of like, you get this, you get like the, there's people working in the garage. Ruby's great for small little little toys. Um, and I actually had a, uh, somebody from a, a large company say, hey, you know, Rails, Ruby, it's great what you guys are doing. You know, our, our Java team is are really proud of you guys. Fantastic, keep it up. But it's like, no, this is actually we're in a real language and we're doing things. Um, but he, he said it was um, like two guys in a garage. It's like, it's great for the things that you can do in a garage. And I'm like, are you serious? Um, and I think, you know, from the, from the Rails perspective, a lot of people, when Rails came out, were, were really excited about Rails um, because it was just so easy. And so you had a lot of like the, the, the fanboy type um, attitude. Um, and, and that's, that's the passion, that's fantastic. Um, but at the same time, when you're going to these large companies, then you need to be able to um, get kind of factual um, with their technology departments. Um, so, you know, one of the perceptions is that it's slow. It kind of is slow. It's not the fastest language in the world. Um, but that's not always a bad thing. There's trade offs. Um, it's immature. It's not really immature. It's been around for, you know, since 93, I believe. Um, so it's that's a, that's a case that you can make against it, um, and it's dangerous. Um, it's not uh, statically typed, so it's scary. You can do all kinds of crazy things with it. And that's totally true. It's super, super <laughs> dangerous. <laughs> you can do some crazy stuff with Ruby. It's super, super scary. Um, but that's a good thing. That's a good thing. That's what testing is for, and that's what um, you know. You don't want to. It's like giving a knife to kids, right? We all get knives as kids, and you have to learn, you have to teach the kid how to use the knife. Um, so people are process. this is kind of a, um, I think a lot of, you know, what in the last talk Corey was talking about communication, um, that's a paramount to almost anything. Um, there it is. And that's a lot of what, uh, what um, spawns failures in, in these large companies. Um, so, like, it, we're humans, and that's how we communicate, that's how we do things, is if we're not communicating, we're not getting anything done. Um, so, you know, there, you come into situations where it's, you've got, you know, somebody saying something. It, this happens in uh, hierarchical structures um, where there's uh, levels of management, and you say something, and then it gets <coughs> transcued into something else, um, and then they start talking about this, and they start talking about that. And it's like, just the message queue just changed. It's like, how did that even happen? You try to make these these uh, these cases in. Uh, <laughs> anybody use Doobly on here? I should play with it. It's the Duke and Ruby Nutter, Charles Nutter's implementation. Um, but you can see how stuff like this totally gets construed, and 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 it's happened where um, we've been in companies, and uh, if it's 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 verbally uh, the the chain of command the as stuff goes up, it, it gets more complicated. Um, and it can just get totally outrageous. <laughs> um, so I think that is, <laughs> that's an important thing to, to think about because uh, even when it's, uh, even when you've got this formal hierarchy that these people have been using for such a long time, um, you, you can see consistent failures um, in the process. Um, so this is kind of the, uh, the, I don't know if you've all heard about the, the 
two pizza teams. And the Amazon uh, has been kind of, I think they coined, um, it was Jeff Bezos, he said that if you can't feed a team with two pizzas, um, it's too large. Uh, or something like that. So you keep, keep small teams. Um, and that way everybody can communicate. The, the V is for virtual, because a lot of companies now are virtual and not in the same place. Um, and it's, this is really an uh, important thing because there's a lot, of, a lot comes out of this, keeping your team small. Um, uh, you know, the, one, the one concern is scalability, and I'll talk about that. Um, but it keeps teams targeted. Um, you've got low costs, you've got high innovation, um, and then everybody on the team knows what everybody else is doing. So you've got really, really pointed goals. Um, and also accountability. So when you're on a small team, you know everybody on the small team, and you don't want to let the other people down. Um, you know, if, if you've got a 50-person team, there could be some guy just sitting there just drinking coffee all day, and you wouldn't even know he was drinking coffee all day and doing nothing. So there's a, that's what managers are for, right? Um, so it's easier to manage in terms of you know, commits, code quality, um, getting actual work done. Um, and then it's, it's non-hierarchical. Um, it's a basically a flat, everybody's on the same page, everybody's driven to do something good. Um, and uh, Greg Linden of Amazon, um, he's the guy who built the uh, recommendation uh, engine. Um, he, he had kind of a, a, a he, he wasn't totally sold on this. He, he, he liked the, just the fact that it's an informal network, that it's flat. Um, because you, know, you actually run into some scalability issues at, um, at bigger levels with this kind of pizza team um, approach. Um, but I, but there's, there's, there's a couple case studies of it uh, working in larger organizations. Um, and this is, I mean, one of the most uh, important things is, you know, keeping communication going. So, worked with a client who refused to set up a chat room with all the um, developers. And there was DBAs, there was all kinds of QA teams involved. Um, and the email, I mean, that's like the worst form of communication ever. It's like postal letters to people, carrier pigeons. It's, it's you, you send an email to somebody because you need something, and then all of a sudden you get it at the very end of the day or the next day. That's not really the way to work. You want to get things done. It could be a blocker. Um, so obviously, setting something up like having campfire set up, chat, or the voice and in-person that kind of happens less because everybody's lazy and doesn't want to actually pick up the phone or push the button on Skype or walk. So that doesn't always happen well. Um, this slide is not a crusade. That is a crusade. I'll take it back. Um, it's a crusade because it's a crusade in one one respect, in the respect that you need to um, you need to you're passionate about something and, and you have the facts facts there and you want to bring that up to um, and, and make more people aware. And you want that to happen and you want it to be consistent. Um, uh, but it's not a crusade in respect of it being a war. Um, it's, this is a diplomatic thing. Um, and as you, as you, you, you want people to be on your side. And you don't want to burn any bridges. Um, so these next slides are kind of an interesting um, way to evaluate uh, uh, kind of large system personnel hierarchy. Um, and that's crazy. That's complicated slide. Um, so here we have um, a hierarchy of um, different levels of management that you might have in a technical organization or just an organization in general. Um, and this is kind of a, a, a method, um, and it's kind of mad, to go and kind of do a little evaluation on where you're at and where you're, where you're uh, where you're, what you're trying to bring to the table and, and, and how well you're doing at it. Um, so you've got you know, approvers, decision makers, evaluators, and users of, of whatever endeavor you're doing. Um, and you're able to basically, um, you, you know who these people are, so it's easy to map out. Um, and then you kind of have the people who are um, adaptability and change. So if we're bringing Ruby into the system, um, there might be some people that don't want that to happen. Um, like the, the laggards, they just don't want any change. It's like you, they just want you to go away. Um, and then you have you know, people with different types of, you know, the, the conservative or the innovators, the visionaries. 
Um, usually you find the innovators and the visionary people um, as being the, uh, your sponsors, the, the stewards to what um, ideas. They're the ones that, uh, that are going to trust you and, um, and, and really drive you forward. Um, so you can see you're kind of building out this, uh, this, 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 this uh, little diagram here. Um, and then you have just kind of who you're talking to there. You know, you might be talking to some of the people quite often. Um, and you might be talking to some of the people that, that already know what you're doing. Um, and they already, they already believe in what you're doing. And so those aren't necessarily the people you want to spend the most time with because they're already on your side. Um, they already know what you're doing. Um, this sounds all crazy, but actually helps um, when you're in these really, really um, kind of high heart rule situations and, and you really need to um, kind of, you need to get things done and you need it to happen, but you need to move slowly because it's not a, a fastest process. Um, and then you have kind of this, your status. So there might be people that just don't like Ruby or don't like dynamic languages. And so they're going to be people you're going to have to work on, um, people you have to spend more time on, people you have to talk to. Um, and then you have like a political structure of an organization. So you've got, you know, these two people are kind of the inner circle. They make a lot of the decisions. Um, and then you have this, you know, the, the general who, who advises them. Um, so this is kind of a, a just a, a, a weird exercise to go through if you ever find yourself in a situation like this on a large team or coming in um, to a large organization where you're trying to make change. Um, so just some examples of um, failures in these types of situations. Um, you know, one is, this is a quote I read recently, not necessarily fixing problems and navigating contradictions. Um, so, we want to, we, as Rubyists, and we want to build stuff because that's what's fun, that's what, that's what we like to do. Um, and uh, we don't want to get into a position where we're sitting there in meetings all day and trying to convince people certain, of certain things and, and reasons why to do things. We want to keep building. Um, so we try to, uh, that's, a, that's a failure in itself, right there in that quote. Um, some examples, um, we're working on a, with a company who had about 50 person team with DBAs, QA, all these other people, and a few different technologies in the mix. And uh, we were, had the problem that we were constrained in our development environment to some machines that did uh, HIPAA compliant stuff so we couldn't run it locally. Um, that, which is a problem. So, as in our internal development environment, we actually relied on these servers that were remote. Um, one guy had a key to these servers, and he went on paternity leave. And when they went down one morning, uh, he was not available. So, there was literally two days of full development where nobody could work. Fifty people not working for two days. I mean, that's just a big fail right there. Um, if, if it was a smaller team, um, it would have been a lot easier to get things done. If people had access to things, it would have been a lot easier to get things done. Um, and this is also can happen. I mean, it's great to have everybody be able to do things, but not everybody on larger teams are competent. Um, so we've had, um, we've had production systems just go down completely because people are think they're in the, their local console, but they're actually remote in production. And they're just <laughs> Um, and then um, another thing that you can get ready to do with, with coming into organizations um, uh, is just uh, internal influence. So you might not be sitting next to these people who are kind of the, uh, the product owners uh, on the company's end, and they might have people there that are not, they don't like Ruby, and so they're going to sit there and they're going to whisper in the ear that anything that you, any type of Anything that you do to try to convince them that this is a good thing, there's always going to be someone there saying that it's not a good thing. Um, so that's when you know, sometimes being on site helps. Um, success stories? Um, we've had some success stories. Uh, um, one that we had was a company that was, they had about 120 machines um, doing God knows what. It was a, a, a Java application. Um, and we came in and we looked at the scenario and said, okay, hey, we think we could, you know, break this down. We're going to rewrite the whole thing in Ruby. Um, it's it's going to be Rails and we're going to consolidate all the projects into a smaller amount. Um, so there's about 30K a month spent just on machines. And 
five developers were maintaining this. So they had five job developers maintaining the system, um, eight different projects. And so we started looking at the, the code base, um, and it was, there was no reason for any of, any of that to happen. And the code was, code was bad. There's no reason it should have been eight projects. No reason it should have been 120 machines. Um, so we were able to refactor this, this, uh, this Java project, and, um, and we took it down to, about, it ran about 40 application processes. Um, it, we refactored it into one project, and there only needed to be one developer um, internally that they needed to maintain. Um, and this is, this is ideal. If you can come into a large organization and you have the opportunity to rewrite everything, I mean, that's like, who wouldn't want to do that? Um, but that never happens. <laughs> like, this is like a little random example that it actually happened. We were able to you know, break it down to about 5K per month um, server spend and just you know, one developer. So I didn't know how much they were being paid. But in most cases, um, that's, yeah, that's not going to happen like that. And um, you're going to be, uh, that's a pyramid. You're going to be at the end of the pyramid with a little pick and shovel. And you're going to be trying to get into the middle of the pyramid where you're able to make influence and say, hey, we're going to change technologies. We're going to use this technology. We're going to move forward with this um, through different parts of the system. Um, and it, it's a long process. It's a long process to get from the outside to the middle, um, unless you can find the little grand gallery in prison. But that doesn't happen that often. Um, so what can we do as um, Rubyists to actually get in there and, um, and make change and, and get this language uh, more adopted in these huge companies? Um, um, one is knowing how to use it. Um, so, you know, Ruby is great for a lot of things, um, but there's some, a lot of things it's not really good for. Um, and so being able to go in confidently and, and, and assess uh, whatever um, situations that um, technology uh, problems that these people are having um, and come up with good, good solutions for them. Um, so, you know, we've had the opportunity to have some, you know, projects within some large companies and, and it was the fact that Ruby wasn't actually the best the best idea, so we we passed it along because we didn't want to come in and that would you know that would be that would be, would be worse if we went in and implemented something that wasn't the right fit. So it's kind of knowing the right uh, what the right tool for the right job is. Um, and the second one that doesn't I think it should happen more is just the documentation of success. Um, there's a lot of uh, case studies out there about Ruby and about um, its applications, but I think there needs to be more. Um, I think I don't have my lanyard on, but Companies like Engineard, um, they do great uh, white papers. Um, they're very active in getting PR out there. And I think that's um, so the more that us as consultants, us as companies can go and um, document the before and after of products that we work on, that is, um, that's kind of paramount. Um, and this is just another horrible slide. I need some design skills. Um, <laughs> It starts with education. So when we're at school, we're in college, we're learning like Pascal or something great like that. And that doesn't really, that doesn't really get people excited about programming. Um, I almost quit because I was learning Pascal as my first course. And I thought, this is programming? This is horrible. Um, so you want to have fun doing it. Um, and so when you have fun doing it, you start making money. And you start making money by working out of, out of business. And then that feeds back into the education. So as we start, uh, as, as large companies start adopting Ruby and it gets more and more commonplace, we're going to see uh, Ruby become, you know, put into the, the education uh, more and more. So it's this kind of cyclic thing. Uh, you've got MIT teaching Python as one of its first courses, and that's fantastic to see. And that uh, doesn't happen enough within universities. So if we can keep this cycle going, that's a really, really, really important thing for, for us um, kind of moving programming uh, languages along um, and uh, moving uh, technology along and making our lives better because we all want to do um, fun things. Um, and we want to like what we do. Um, that's it.
Repeat the, the question, point. please. Oh, so his uh, his question was that uh, framework for evaluating um, hierarchical structures within with organizations. Um, is that something that I just made up? Um, no, I learned that. Uh, I was taught that from somebody. Um, and it, uh, if you have the time to do that and you're, uh, you have the resources to do that, I highly recommend it. Um, I'm sure the slides will be available. So it's, I think it's a standard in some, some field. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.